Hi everybody, how's it going? And welcome to the first episode of Walking and Talking with Chris. And I'm your host, Steve Oliver. No, of course I'm not Steve Oliver. I'm Chris Bonomo, for those of you who know me. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Bonomo. I am a, a, an artist. I am the owner of 13 Degree Studios. And I am an honored to be a member of the board of directors for Rittenhouse Square, the Fine Art Association. So I'm here in Rittenhouse today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the park and a little bit more about the sculptures that are in the park. Many that you might know and some you might have not noticed before. Uh, before we get into talking about the park, let's talk about the first sculpture that was put in the park, and that is right here where we are. And this is called Lion Crushing a Serpent. So this was the first sculpture that was installed in Rittenhouse Square Park. This was sculpted and actually, as you can see right here, there is the foundry name, the founder uh, in Paris, Barry, the artist's name, and the date the sculpture was made. So, this was created by Anton Louis Barry, who was a French sculptor. He lived from 1796 to 1875. So he is the the oldest of the sculptors that are represented in the park. So this piece was actually created in 1832. This was cast in 1891. Now, I want to say uh, real quick, for those of you who don't know, there are different avenues of, of sculpture and art. There's direct carving, which is something I do. I carve wood, I carve stone. And that's a one of a kind, it's, it's one off, never recreated. Then with bronzes, there's a, there is a, a different way that these are made. Quite often they're, they're cast, first they're created in clay, hand direct by the artist. Then they are made into plaster molds, and off of those molds, a modern technique is they'll make rubber molds off of them. They make waxes, the waxes go to the foundry, the, the bronzes are cast at the foundry. What that allows is that allows more than one to be made. So you could have multiples from an original sculpture. Now that'll come into play in another sculpture. We'll talk about that. So what you'll get with the bronzes is even though the sculpture was created in 1832, that cast isn't until 60 or so years later, 1891. So now Antoine Louis Barry is very famous and maybe the most famous of what is called an animalier which is a sculptor who does most of their work and is an expert in sculpting animals. He was tremendous at this, and he has a wide variety of animals that he sculpted. And he was also, though, very kind of, he was criticized by his contemporaries at the time, because for a sculptor at the time, marble was not a normal, uh, I'm sorry, bronze was not a normal choice. Marble was the preferred material where he would send it out and have a company carve his sculpture in marble. Now, he wasn't that normal of a guy in that he, he was more modern in his thinking. He was very bold in his subject matter. Um, this, the, now, this sculpture was... I said it was the first. It was the first installed in Rittenhouse. This was actually bought directly from the Fairmount Park Art Association, which now is the Association for Public Art in Philadelphia. It was installed on this site in 1892, so right at, you know only right after it was cast. Um, funny thing about Barry is he struggled financially. He really struggled because he wasn't part of the mainstream. So. At one point in his life, he had to sell a lot of his molds, his models, and they were bought. At one point, he sold 150 of them. They were bought up, and then what happened was then they'd get sent out. Poor, shoddy casts were made, poor bronzes, low-quality bronzes, and they were sold everywhere. So his name really dropped, and his reputation dropped because there was a mass production of his work. Um, later in life, after that... He, uh, he was able to get his reputation back and, and, and 
before he died, he had become renowned for as well as uh, uh, good a sculptor as he was. But he really was a magnificent sculptor. And this is the largest of the single standing sculptures in the, in the park. So this is um, in Han Lodi Batty Lion Crushing the Serpent. Okay, let's move on. Um, let's walk towards. Uh, let's go this way. I'm put my mask on as we walk. And then we'll go. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about. Tell you a little bit about the park as we walk. <coughs> so everybody knows Rittenhouse Park for being. <coughs> let's walk back to this entrance, Sandy. And as always, I have my wonderful. My wonderful accomplice, partner in crime, Amanda who's a wonderful helper, camera gal, boss, and all that stuff. Okay. So, <clears throat> Rittenhouse Park was part of the original design layout of Philadelphia. When William Penn was designing Philadelphia, he wanted to create a city that was unlike European cities, that a lot of these European cities were so old they kind of had no rhyme or reason to their layout. In Philadelphia, and the beauty of, of, of building a new country was he had the ability to design the city how he wanted it to be. He wanted to lay out in a, in a very orderly geometric pattern, which is what Center City Philadelphia still has today. Now, he wasn't smart enough, and he wasn't a futurist by any matter, because he didn't realize that he would absolutely can't hear you. Oh, sorry, I dropped something. He would not realize that Philadelphia streets would be too narrow to deal with any future modes of transportation <laughs> I'm thought of at the time. So he was brilliant in one aspect. And he wasn't thinking ahead in another, as anybody who's driven on Philadelphia Street can tell you. <clears throat> so, Rittenhouse Park, or Rittenhouse Square, Rittenhouse Square was originally built in 1683. It was built in 1683, but it was called Southwest Square, and it was part one of five public spaces that he had laid out. Five public spaces were, you have City Hall, which is where City Hall obviously sits. You got Southwest Square, which is Rittenhouse Square now. You got Logan Circle, which was actually Logan Square before it was redesigned into the circle. You have Washington Square, which is really a mirror image of Rittenhouse Square. And then you have Franklin Square, which is the most obscure and unknown one. That is, you come off the Brent Franklin Bridge, that is the square where the new Gucci sculpture is in front of. That is Franklin Square. So this was named Southwest Square until, and I want you to kind of look at, at these as well, until um, in 1825, they renamed it Rittenhouse after David Rittenhouse, who was a descendant of the first paper maker in Philadelphia. And it was his family that were the paper makers, and they did it just outside of Philadelphia at the time, which now is part of Philadelphia, which um, it's on the Wissahickon Creek over by Forbidden Drive, and they actually have where their mill was, is an area called Rittenhouse Town, and it's still there, there's a bunch of buildings over there, and some of them are still privately owned, and it's kind of a cool thing to ride your bike through the little Rittenhouse Square Town. Um, so in 1913, an artist architect named Paul Crete was hired to redesign the park. He redesigned Rittenhouse and put, you see, he redid the entrances, put the reflecting pools in, and his thought was he wanted to create more of a Parisian park, give it a, a Parisian garden feel. Now, another thing that he did was he was part of the group that was hired and designed the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. So you can kind of see the Parisian influence in there where he wanted to create a, a, a Champs-Élysées type of, of, of wide avenue in Philadelphia that represented that, that region. So these, uh, these greyhounds here 
they're not necessarily on my tour, so to speak, but so they were donated. The artist is unknown of them. And they were donated to the park in 1986. So a fairly recent acquisition. Um, so that's a little bit of the kind of... Now, one thing about the park, the park has always been a very desirable area of the city. Ever since early 18th century, this has been an area desirable. It's been a focal point. Um, as most young boys who are in their early 20s will attest, this is where you come and bring dates because you can look sophisticated with no money. You bring the girls up here and it can be a little dark and there's lots of benches and you know you put a little bit of a couple drinks dark benches date and you know you never know what where it's going to lead so this has always been the, the late night stroll for lots of guys and gals um all right we did anton louis brie let's go and we're going to go we're going to do Paul Manship next. Paul Manship is the artist who sculpted the girl holding a duck, which everybody calls duck girl. He might be the most famous of all the sculptors in the park. lived from 1885 to 1960. So much more contemporary than Anton Weaver, who was an American sculptor. Um, and he worked, at this point in his life, this is a really neoclassical example of sculpture at the time. Uh, he started very neoclassical and then he wound up moving into a very terrific Art Deco style. So you can almost see the beginnings of it in his, his neoclassical uh, stylizations that he wound up going into that. It's about five foot one inches tall. It's on a limestone base right here. This is an addition by the Park Service. Um, so this was also directly bought by the Fairmount Park Art Association. Well, the Association for Public Art. This was, was, was sculpted in 1911. It was first exhibited at the Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia in 1914. And it won the, the uh, wider gold medal from PAFA that year, from the, from the Academy. So it was, from the time it was made, it was absolutely, it was a winner from, from day one. It was originally installed in Cloverleaf Park in 1916 in the city, was damaged, moved into storage. Now in 1960, members of the Rittenhouse Square Improvement Association found it in storage and had it moved into the park. Now, something cool about Paul Manship is he's got work all over the country. Um, maybe the most famous piece of his that you might have seen, but you don't know it's his, is the Prometheus that's at Rockefeller Center, the big gold sculpture at Rockefeller Center. That's a Paul Manship. So this is a really nice piece in the park. His work's beautiful. If you've never heard of Paul Manship, check him out, because his Art Deco stuff is really amazing. So, all right, let me give him a hand. So then we'll go to something a little more obscure while we're over here. So <coughs> I told you how Paul Crete was the guy who redesigned these fountains and reflecting pools. Um, so he gets credit for all this, but there's a little sculpture on the backside here. That's something that's kind of is like overlooked. So here we go. So now here, you have this little relief right here, okay? And I have talked about relief sculpture before. That's a perfect example of a, of a relief sculpture. That is the side view portrait in relief. So that relief, it's actually called the, um, well, it's the J. William White, uh, the Dr. J. William White Memorial. And now that was sculpted by Art Tate McKenzie. So a different person made it. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, Paul Philip Crete. So he lived 1867 to 1938, 
Um, so, Dr. William White was a um, founding member of the Rittenhouse Square Improvement Association. So he was a member of the square, and it's on, I just said, on the back side of the fountain, which was done in 1913. And, you know, just a little hidden thing that you don't necessarily see. How much time we got, Mandy? Where are we at on time? We're at 28 minutes. 28 minutes? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Huh? No. I'm at 15 minutes. Oh. All right. Look at the front. All right, we can walk, and people can walk. Uh, as you can see, the park used by so many people, even on a chilly December day. But here we go. This is our frog. Actually, so as you can see here, most sculptures will always have a some sort of plaque or signing on them. So the giant frog was sculpted by Cornelia von Aachen Chapin, 1893 to 1972. Now she was interesting because she was also an animalier, did a lot of work with animals. This is a piece of granite she carved. Um, what she did, which was really cool is she carved directly from life. She didn't carve from models. She didn't carve from sketches. She carved from what she saw happening. So she would watch these animals and carve what she saw. So she carved directly from life. She was born in Connecticut, so she was another American. Um, she exhibited first in the third annual uh, International Sculpture Exhibition in Philadelphia, which had 252 pieces of art had 250,000 people in Philadelphia came to that exhibition, which was just a terrific, a terrific turnout to see art in this city, which, you know, like the Rittenhouse show gets that as well. So um, this was built by the, yeah, the Rittenhouse Square. Oh, this was built by the Rittenhouse Square. The um, Improvement Association commissioned it directly. So this was, uh, in 1941 is when this was, was, was brought in here. So during World War II. Now, one thing you're seeing about a lot of these sculptures size-wise, and we'll get into the next one, uh, the next couple in particular, just note the size of this in relation to a person, okay? So just keep that in your mind, and we'll, we'll talk about that as, as we move on. <clears throat> a little, some of those in the little nooks and crannies, people don't notice as much as the ones that are in these, in these entries. So now we're getting. Here we go. Again, you have some flapping. You have your plinth. So this is the... You can look at your cards, they so, can't see you. This is the Evelyn Taylor Price Memorial Sundial sculpture. Um, she was an American sculptor as well. She was born in Philadelphia. She's really known for a lot of her work with like, she did really whimsical and fun fountains. Uh, so a connection, she had a lot of art connections. Thomas Eakins, probably the most famous Philadelphia painter. He was a friend of the family. So had that art connection right off of the bat. Um, she studied at the Industrial uh, School of Industrial Arts, which later became University of the Arts, and then she also studied at the Academy. So, so this is another bronze. As you can see, a lot of this stuff in here is bronze. Bronze or stone, which are the classic materials. This was commissioned directly in 1947 by Rittenhouse Square the Improvement Association again. This was 
is in memory of Evelyn Taylor, who was president of the Improvement Association, and she was long-term president of the Flower Association. So here we go. The sculptor brought Flowers. the flower connection part of her life into this with the sundial as well. So the sundial is composed of two children holding a sunflower, which on the face also has the sundial in its face. Um, it was a critic once said this was a, a, po a poetical reminder of the fleeting joys of sunshine. So, again, look, look at the size and the scale of this sculpture. Not too big. Something that fits into the, the premise of the park. In it's not about grandeur, it's about intimacy. And everything you've seen in this park, they're intimate sculptures, they're approachable. And they're part of the park, they're not overwhelming the park. And that's going to be most important in the, the next and last sculpture we go to look at, which is probably the most famous sculpture in the park. At least by a certain segment of the park's population. <laughs> So I wasn't a kid growing up in Philadelphia. I didn't move here until I was 18 years old. But I have spent, being 50 now, a great part of my life has been in this city. But all of my friends that grew up in this city can tell you all the times they've climbed on this sculpture. Because that's what they do. They climb on this sculpture. And some of them will tell you the first time they remember climbing on it and the first time they fell off of it the first time they wanted to take it home and, and argue with their parents that they should have this and at the very least they want to have one of their own so. me too and amanda wants one too and so do i <laughs> but i want mine to have a heartbeat and these stuff this one necessarily doesn't even though there'll be something interesting i'll tell you about squirrels gardens We're very lucky. What's that? We're very lucky. Oh yeah. Nobody climbing on it at the moment. Very rare time. All right. So this is Billy. Billy the goat. So. Stand next to it so people can see the size. So the size, yeah. So here's it. Now, look at the wear that's starting on this. All right. So this was sculpted by Albert Lacey. Yeah. It was so realistic that his contemporaries accused him of casting directly from life, that he didn't sculpt them. So he had to prove to them by sculpting another, 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 another piece directly in wax. Look what I can do. I can do this. It's not cast from life. He was another animalier. So, as you can see, there's a lot of animals in the park and a lot of brilliant, brilliant animal sculptors in the park. He was American from Philadelphia and he taught at the Academy of Fine Arts for over 20 years. He also won, in 1918, he won the, the wider gold medal as well. Maybe the most famous piece he has, other than this one, he has the penguins at the Pennsylvania Zoo. Everybody knows the penguins from Albert Lacey. So, this was created in 1914 and installed in 1919. Bronze on granite. Now, this was based on their family goat. So this was his family's goat that he sculpted this from. <laughs> now, even though it's bronze, bronze over time gets thin from so many kids over a hundred years climbing on this. What happened was they had to recast it. So in 2018, this goat was put in direct exact casting of the original goat. The original is now in the library branch, the Rittenhouse, in the children's room. They oh. brought it inside and put it in the, the Rittenhouse branch of the public library. So, that's one of the benefits of bronze. You can have an exact reproduction of the piece you have. That's a benefit of, of mold making, model making. So in this instance, it's, it's a wonderful thing that the original got too fragile and too broken to use. So they are able to keep the goat because the goat is just it's really a fabric of this park. So these are just a few of the there are some more sculptures in, in the park I didn't get to. But I
wanted to hit the ones that, to me, speak the loudest. Um, it's a great park. We're really lucky to have this park be part of the city and to be able to have our show at this park. We're so fortunate. So I wanted to thank you guys for watching. I also wanted to say check out the pop-up gallery. It's up through the weekend to the beginning of next week. Great art in there. It's a great time to support artists right now. Um, it's a great time to buy something online, socially distant, where it gets shipped, whether it's for you, whether it's for a friend, a loved one. Uh, check out the gallery. There's so much good stuff. There's 53 artists. There's over 200 pieces of, of art that are just as good as anything you see here in that gallery. So uh, thanks for watching. I had a blast. Thanks to Amanda for filming. Um, give me some feedback on what part of the city you want me to go to next because there's a whole city I can talk about or, and, uh, or anything else you want me to talk about. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for watching. Love to y'all. Be good. And thank you from the Rittenhouse Square Bar uh, Board. And enjoy the five o'clock shows.